in the next section, we're going to discuss the key concept of functional residual capacity. This is a lung volume that takes into account a lot of the pulmonary mechanics and intrinsic properties about the lung. Welcome back. The next section of our pulmonary physiology discussion, we're going to talk about functional residual capacity and a couple other things that are important to lung mechanics. FRC is really the equilibrium point of the lung. It's the low volume point of the lung. It's where there's a balance between those transmural, the blowing up balloon, or distending forces are in balance with the collapsing or elastic recoil forces. And it's going to be different for different disease states. This diagram shows what we're talking about. If you had a couple weights and a spring, where those weights in the spring, the height at which they balanced, would be a product of two different things how thick and tight the spring was, and also how many weights you had on there. Lungs with higher elastic recoil, for example, the fibrotic lungs, low compliance lungs, are going to have a lower FRC. Lungs with less elastic recoil, as in the example of emphysema, are going to have a higher FRC. We're going to talk about this more. So for example, the normal lung with a normal FRC, normal total lung capacity, compare that with an emphyseminous lung. Remember, the lung volumes are increased in emphysema. Along with that increased lung volume, we've got increased residual volume. We've got more gas that's trapped in the lungs, somewhat a property of dynamic airway collapse. Functional residual capacity, as we've got less elastic recoil, creates a higher FRC. In the interstitial fibrosis with lower total lung capacity, lower residual volume, the FRC or the equilibrium point is lower. The chest wall is also going to play a role in contributing to FRC. These graphs showing the effect of both the chest wall and the lung on the compliance of the entire respiratory system are somewhat confusing. So let's take a little bit of time to go through them. This is the exact same graph as the compliance curve that we showed earlier. Looking first at the lung line, imagine you had just a set of lungs and you looked at the volume, you looked at the pressure it took to increase that lung volume. That's the same as the compliance curve we showed in the last section. Now let's say instead of just looking at the lungs, we look at just the chest wall. Let's say we had a cadaver with the lungs taken out and looked at just the chest wall on its own you could generate a compliance curve for just that chest wall. The amount of pressure it took to increase the volume of the chest wall. If you combine those two graphs together, you can get the total compliance curve of the respiratory system, or the lung plus the chest wall. And this is a little bit confusing and a little bit artificial, because anytime you've got muscles contracting, as in the case with an awake alert patient, you're going to see it's going to become too difficult to define the compliance curve because muscle contractions are going to prevent us from adequately measuring what a change in volume causes in terms of a change in pressure. Remember, at FRC there's a balance. The chest wall wants to expand out and the lungs want to collapse down. Now just as we can see a change in the FRC because of elastic recoil properties in the case of emphysema, where the FRC is higher, or in the case of fibrosis, where the FRC is lower, we can see a change in the FRC as a result of a chest wall property. For example, if you had a very, very obese patient with a lot of adipose tissue on that chest wall, the chest wall is going to want to expand out less. Similarly, if you had someone that was pregnant and you had a fetus that was preventing the chest wall from expanding out as much, each of those cases are going to cause the FRC to be lower. There's less elastic recoil, excuse me, less distending forces of the chest wall. You can also see this in the case of kyphoscoliosis, somebody with severe spinal disease. Reviewing a couple points about FRC. FRC simply defined as the residual volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. 
But more importantly, it represents the low equilibrium point of the lung, the low energy point of the lung. And that FRC is determined by a balance of the distending forces, the chest wall wanting to expand out, and collapsing forces, the lung wanting to collapse down. Regardless of what your lung volume is, regardless of everything else, the FRC is determined by those two things. So no matter what else is going on, if you know what the distending forces are and what the collapsing forces are, you're going to be able to determine the FRC. And it's really the starting point of all of our discussions of lung physiology. FRC is also, importantly, the end of a quiet exhalation, the end of a normal tidal breath. Let's do a question. A patient with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease, has weakness of all of his or her skeletal muscles. We would expect him or her to likely have a normal, do we expect them to have a normal residual volume, total lung capacity, vital capacity, or FRC? So if we go through these, total lung capacity, vital capacity, and RV, all will likely be lower. This ALS or any other neuromuscular disease is going to cause restrictive physiology. We're not going to be able to increase our lung volume as much. But actually, FRC is going to stay the same. There's nothing about muscle weakness that has made this patient's chest wall wanting to expand out or lungs to collapse down change. So FRC is actually going to stay the same. Now you might argue that because residual volume is decreasing, wouldn't we expect residual volume, to wouldn't we expect FRC to decrease as well? Because residual volume is one of the components of FRC. And that's actually not the case. FRC is just determined by the chest wall and the lungs themselves. So though the residual volume is decreasing, we would expect the expiratory reserve volume to increase to compensate for it. This is a tough question, so don't worry if it's confusing. A patient with COPD develops a pneumothorax. This is a collapsed lung. When a bleb, or a large bubble of lung, pops, which way is the air going to go when the patient takes a deep breath? Would we expect air to rush in from the pleural space into the lung, or to air to rush from the lung into the pleural space? Now, if you've taken care of a patient with a pneumothorax, you know the answer is obviously B. Air is going to rush out of their lungs into the pleural space. And the reason for that is with each negative breath, with each breath, we create negative pleural pressure. We get negative pressure in the chest wall. So there's a gradient for air to go from the lung into the chest wall. And that's going to lead to the collapsing of the lung. This is another tough question. During a respiratory physiology experiment, a volunteer takes a 500 cc tidal breath, starting at normally at FRC, and then, after a period of rest, he takes a 500 cc tidal breath, but he starts a liter above FRC. Compared to breathing in FRC, breathing above FRC will be associated with an increase of all the following except. Let's go through each of the answers. Answer A is airway diameter. If the patient's at a higher lung volume, we actually expect his airway diameter to increase. So A is not correct. Lung compliance, answer B. As we go to higher and higher lung volumes, remember, the compliance is actually going to decrease. So it looks like B may be the correct answer. Answer C, work of breathing. As we go to higher and higher lung volumes, we haven't talked about this specifically, but you can imagine the work of breathing is higher. So work of breathing is actually going to increase. And we haven't talked about pulmonary vascular resistance at all. But do know that as we go to higher and higher lung volumes, we're going to start to see, as we distend more alveoli, some, some capillaries are going to collapse. We're going to create more west zone 1 lung. So airway diameter, work of breathing, and pulmonary vascular resistance are all going to increase as we go to higher and lung volumes. Lung compliance, however, is going to decrease. And the correct answer here is B. I'm going to introduce briefly the concept of surfactant. Surfactant is a molecule that's made by type 2 pneumocytes in the lung. What surfactant does is to normalize the surface tension of the alveoli. 
Surfactant can be think of, thought of like a detergent. For example, if we put soap in water, we're able to blow bubbles out of those water. That the, those bubbles don't pop. The soap acts as a detergent to help keep the bubbles from popping. Surfactant does that in the lungs. It lowers surface tension in such a way that alveoli of different size can exist. If we had no surfactant, we would expect the pressure in the smaller alveoli to be greater than the pressure in the larger alveoli, and air therefore, air therefore would rush from the small alveoli into the large alveoli. We couldn't have that. We want to have air getting to all alveoli. We want to normalize the air distribution so we can have healthy gas exchange. Factant accomplishes this. And we know that this is a pathological process as we examine disease such as hyaline membrane disease. Infants that are born prematurely don't have fully developed type 2 pneumocytes and don't produce surfactant, and they get a dense infiltrate in their lungs. This can be treated by giving recombinant versions of surfactant. Review a couple topics before we break again. Lung volumes, remember tidal volume and residual volume, most important. Lung capacity is, remember, functional residual capacity, vital capacity, total lung capacity are most important. We have to be able to memorize these terms to understand how they're going to relate to different physiologic conditions. Airflow is defined by Ohm's law. The most important contributor to resistance is the radius, as we know from Pousset's law. The large airways or the medium-sized airways are what's contributing most to the airway resistance. And remember that obstruction is an expiratory disease. Forced expiration is going to lead to more collapse of airways, more dynamic airway collapse. And we try to limit our airway resistance by controlling the autonomic input to airway smooth muscles. By giving beta-2 agonists, we want to bronchodilate, get more air in. I want to introduce an uh, important point now. Think about what would the point be? Why does our body have a system that would lead to bronchoconstriction? Why would we want smaller airways? We're going to talk about that later as we talk about ventilation and perfusion matching. The last thing we talked about was compliance. Remember, compliance is the change in volume over the change in pressure. It's the inverse of elastance. An emphyseminous lung has a high compliance. It's got a high FRC. It's got a low elastance. A fibrotic lung, it's got a low compliance, a low FRC, but it has a high elastance. Lack of surfactant, as in the case of hyaline membrane disease or infant respiratory distress syndrome, it's going to cause a very, very stiff, low compliance lung. That concludes our discussion of functional residual capacity, FRC, and lung mechanics.